Dear Heavenly Father, may you fill us with your Holy Spirit as we are here before you today. May you fill our minds and heart and may you speak to to me, uh, through me, your servant today, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Before we battle. So let me set the scene for you for today's story. This, you can see here, there's Israel. This is a modern map, Google Maps. Israel, Jordan, Jerus- uh, Jerusalem's there, and Lebanon. The countries, this is the area, this is the focus of today's um, story. But the setting is between 850 and 874 years before Jesus. So nearly 3,000 years ago. And the nation is Judah. And the king is Jehoshaphat. And we find this story of Jehoshaphat in uh, 1 Kings and in 2 Chronicles. And just to give you an idea, this is a little breakup of the political uh, feeling at the time. So Jerusalem in the middle there with Judah. Um, and these boundaries changed over time. But this just, just gives you a context of, of where we are. Now, it wasn't a nice time to live. Um, With so many countries around, sometimes they were allies, sometimes they were friends, and sometimes they were enemies. Uh, For example, I want to look at um, this person, who's Asher Nasserpal II. He was the king of Assyria during a similar time period. And he was a real nasty piece of work. This guy, once he would defeat your city, he would line all the people up. And some of the young men, he would cut their hands and feet off. Um, And then he would make a pile of ears. Um, He would take lips and noses off just for the message that you don't mess with me. And also... um, some of the older men, he would make a big tower that would probably reach up to the, to the roof here, of heads. Um, just as a, this is outside the city that he conquered, just as a reminder that you don't mess with the Assyrians. And if that wasn't bad enough, the, the little kids were burnt alive. So this was what God calls an abomination. Um, And I'm repulsed by the thought of this action as well. And I think today, if these things were happening and we knew about them, we would be saying, God, please bring your judgment upon people doing this type of thing. So this is the environment that our story is in today. And Jehoshaphat was... um, you know, just I guess Israel and Judah were below Assyria, uh, but the, the the this was a time of war, and it wasn't a pretty time. So I want you to open your Bibles up if you can to Second Chronicles, chapter twenty, and we're going to be reading through uh, the whole chapter pretty much uh, a few verses at a time. So Second Chronicles. Uh, chapter 20, verse 1. Now, I'm reading from the ESV, the English Standard Version today. So keep your finger in there, because we'll be, we'll be, I'll be going back and forwards um, from this, the, the rest of our time together. So 2 Chronicles 20, verse 1. After this, the Moabites and the Ammonites, and with them some of the Meonites, came against Jehoshaphat for battle. Okay, so before we go any further, I wanted to, um, let's look at what's happening here. There's three nations against uh, Jehoshaphat, the Moabites, the Ammonites, and the Meonites. Jehoshaphat was the king of Judah, and Jehoshaphat's great-great-grandfather was King Solomon, that you'll know. And Jehoshaphat's dad was King Asa, and he was known to be on and off with God, not not too bad, Um, but Jehoshaphat was a man known to be like um, David, who sought God with all his heart. So who were the Moabites and the Ammonites? Is this just a made-up story? 
Here's a, a map, just a rough map at the time of these nations. And you can see Ammon from the Ammonites, Moab and Edom of the Meonites down the bottom there. So about 500 years prior to this, Moses was nearly, had nearly died and Joshua was coming across into the promised land. And there's some specific instructions that God had given to Moses that he was not to set one foot inside any of these three countries. So Moab, Ammon, and Edom, he was to steer clear and not even put his foot inside their territories. Now, you may or may not know, but Ammon and Moab are the descendants of Lot. So Lot's two daughters are just one country each. And also Esau is descended from Edom. And you can also trace Jesus' lineage through Moab and Ruth and Boaz. So there's connections there. And also Moab existed, um, we find in Egyptian, Assyrian, and Old Testament um, text that have uh, information about Moab. And this is the Moab, Moabite stone, or the Mesha Stella. And this records events around, from around that time period. So having countries so close to each other, there can be friction that occurs. So now, continuing in verse 2. Some men came and told Jehoshaphat, a great multitude is coming against you from Edom, from beyond the sea, that's the Dead Sea, and behold, you are in Hatsetson Tamar, that is En Gedi. So a great multitude, how many do you think a great multitude is? Maybe 100,000, 200,000, maybe 500,000 would be a great multitude. I think that would be a lot of people. But the Bible doesn't say, but we can get a bit of an idea uh, about how big this may have been through um, going back a bit before in Chronicles chapter 16, 12. It lists there um, a number of armies, or sorry, the size of the army uh, for Jehoshaphat. And I added these up, and at, this, at that time it was 1,160,000 mighty men of valor who uh, were, on, were, were enlisted, but besides that, there were um, the gatekeepers, the guards, the, the local police. So there, there were a lot of people at that time. So at this time, we don't know whether there was that many or less or more, but Jehoshaphat had been building up his army and his defenses for a number of years and was in a really good um, position, uh, I guess financially, to do so. So coming into verse 3, then Jehoshaphat was afraid and set his face to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. And Judah assembled to seek help from the Lord from all the cities of Judah. They came to seek the Lord. So this wasn't Jehoshaphat's first battle. He had experienced in the past. Previously, he'd helped out a neighbor, Israel. He aligned himself with King Ahab, um, but that didn't turn out well. Ahab got, got killed in that battle by a stray arrow, but Jehoshaphat was spared by God. So you, were, you could ask the question, why didn't he just ask for help from Israel? But instead of making his own plans, the very first thing he did was set his face to seek the Lord. So what does this mean? You know, is God on the east or the west? No, I think, you know, whatever we turn our face to, is what my attention is. If my face is there or if I turn my face over here, this is where my attention is. And so Jehoshaphat set his face to the Lord. It means he stopped everything and wanted some help from God. So when was the last time that you sought help from God? Was it this week? Um, was it today? Or is it moment by moment? You know, or is it only when you can solve a big problem, when you can't solve a big problem? I wonder what kind of relationship did Jehoshaphat have to be, to be able to respond in this way? So you know, what makes Jehoshaphat turn his face to seek God? I'm just going to look a little bit again, back a few chapters, and I'm going to summarize these points 
but you're welcome to go back there later. It's found in 2 Chronicles 17 through to 19, where we learn a bit about Jehoshaphat and who he was, what type of guy he was. So he did not seek the Baals, but sought God. So from, from his time of starting uh, in the kingdom, he would seek God's will and be obedient. Second, he followed the commandments and not the way of the wicked Ahab of Israel. So he, God's word he valued, and he, he tried to enact that out in his life. Number three, Jehoshaphat called on God. Many instances where Ahab was killed by the stray arrow, Jehoshaphat was surrounded and he said, God help me, and God helped him. So he was, he was accustomed to calling out to God, putting his trust in God. Uh, four, his actions followed his words and he prepares his heart to seek God. So actually, Jehoshaphat set up a, basically an educational system where he set up um, judges and um, teachers where he taught the Bible, like the Torah, uh, to, to his whole community. And number five, he established a fair and just nation. So he valued, um, in, you know, he, he wasn't like the other king of Assyria who, um, you know, was just out there to, um, I guess, build his own empire up. He cared for people. He set up a justice, justice system to help the, the, um, those people who were persecuted or those people that were poor. So he, he, he valued these type of things. So when we seek God in our daily lives, not just emergencies, I guess it shows us that we can really value and love him. And now, continuing in verse 5 of the story. And Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem, in the house of the Lord, before the new court. And he prayed this prayer. So he hears that there's an army coming. All the surrounding countries are coming to fight against him. He sets his face to God, and now he's in the temple, and all the people are there. They came from all around, and now he's going to pray a prayer. O Lord God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. In your hand are power and might, so that none is able to withstand you. Did you not, our God, drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham and and your friend? So he's recounting the promises that God made. And they have lived in it and have built it for you in it a sanctuary for your name, saying, If disaster comes upon us, the sword, judgment, or pestilence, or famine, we will stand before this house, before you. For your name is in this house, and cry out to you in our affliction, and you will hear and save. And now behold the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir. Just going to pause there for a second. This is just an interesting little tidbit. Mount Seir means, anyone know what it means? It means the hairy. So who was hairy in the Bible? Esau. Perfect. So this was was Esau's territory, Edom. Um, it's, they actually say it's because of the tree, those very trees forested on the hill as well, but I think it's because of Esau. <laughs> it's the hairy. So, and now behold, the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, whom you would not let Israel invade, when they came from the land of Egypt and whom they avoided and did not destroy, behold, they reward us by coming to drive us out of your possession, which you have given us to inherit. O oh, our God, will you not execute judgment on them? For we are powerless against this great horde that is coming against us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. This is a beautiful and honest prayer. It says it all. Not only are they powerless because there's so many in number, but I wonder if they are feeling between a rock and a hard place. I mean, they've been reminded not to touch these nations in the past. So how do you defend yourself against this attack? 
And I just love how the prayer finishes. We do not know what to do. We just, we just have no idea how to deal with the situation. But our eyes are on you. I can relate to this, and I'm sure you can as well. Meanwhile, all Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones, with their wives, and their children. When was the last time your family stood together to seek the Lord? And how might that look? When was the last time our church stood together, the oldest to the newborn, to come together and seek God? Yes, we come every week and we're here today, but it's oftentimes that we face a a big battle, a difficulty, that we come together. And I know this community has come together in the past in this way. What was it that made everyone want to trust and follow in Jehoshaphat? I think we can get a sense of the preparation that led to the bold behavior of Jehoshaphat and the people. In chapter 17, verse 9, it says, So they taught in Judah, and they had the book of the law of the Lord with them. And they went throughout all the cities of Judah and taught the people. So three years after he became king, he set up the educational system of sharing God's word with his, with his people. And because of that, the, the surrounding nations feared God. So knowing about God, though, didn't save these people. It was them being willing to seek God that made the difference. When we covenant with God, we can trust him. And now God responds to Jehoshaphat's prayer. And the spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, son of Benaniah, son of Jael, son of Mananiah, a Levite of the sons of Asaph. Now if you look in Psalms, David has wrote a lot of Psalms, but also Asaph has written a lot of Psalms. So this person, Jehaziel, is a descendant of Asaph. a musically minded um, prophet. And he said, listen, all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem and King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you, do not be afraid and do not be dismayed at this great horde, for this battle is not yours but God's. What an awesome promise. This battle is not yours but God's. What sort of battle are you facing today? Is it a relationship? Is it financial? Or is it a purpose, your sense of purpose or identity? Just like Jehoshaphat claimed God's earlier promises, you too can claim these promises. So let's claim it as ours. God is saying to you, don't be afraid or discouraged about that massive problem in front of you. The solution is not yours, but God's to find. Tomorrow, I'm reading from verse 16. Tomorrow go down against them. Behold, you will come up by the ascent of Ziz. You will find them at the end of the valley, east of the wilderness of Jeruel. You will not need to fight in this battle. Stand firm, hold your position, and see the salvation of the Lord on your behalf. O Judah and Jerusalem, do not be afraid. Do not be dismayed. Tomorrow, go out against them, and the Lord will be with you. (coughs) Jehoshaphat doesn't just sit back and relax now that he has God's answer, but he will be asked to demonstrate his faith. Stand firm, hold your position, and see the salvation of the Lord on your behalf. How encouraging is this? The battles that we think we need to fight are actually God's battles to win for the, God's battles to win for us. He's actually wanting to fight them. We don't need to be afraid or dismayed. Then Jehoshaphat, in verse 18, bowed his head with his face to the ground, and all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell down before the Lord, worshiping him. And the Levites and the Kohathites and the Korahites stood up to praise the God, 
praise the Lord, the God of Israel, with a very loud voice. This was not some uh, you know, quiet little whisper. They were praising God before the battle had even started. And they rose early in the morning and went out into the wilderness of Tekoa. And when they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, Judah, and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and you will be established. Believe the prophets, and you will succeed. And when he had taken counsel with the people, he appointed those who were to sing. He appointed the musicians to sing to the Lord and to praise him in holy attire. As they went before the army, so they're in front of the army, the choir, and say, give thanks to the Lord for his steadfast love endures forever. So it was after they demonstrated their faith through praising God that God did as he promised. And now we'll see the salvation of the Judeans. Verse 22. And when they began to sing and praise, as soon as they went, began to sing and praise, the Lord set an ambush against the men of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who had come against Judah, so that they were routed. For the, for the men of Ammon and Moab rose against the inhabitants of Mount Seir, devoting them to destruction. And when they had made an end of the inhabitants of Seir, they all helped to destroy each other. So this is amazing. When is the last time you stood and praised God as you faced a difficulty? Nehemiah 8.10 says, Do not be dismayed, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. We can gain strength through difficult times when we praise God. The specifically chosen choir begins to sing and praise God and the ambush God sets. So how did this happen? Was it angels? Possibly. He certainly could have sent angels, but it doesn't say this. I think God did it another way. In Exodus 23, 28, God promises to drive out the evil inhabitants of these lands with hornets. So God, God's plan is to clear the path before us. He doesn't expect us to get our hands bloody in fighting our battles. He doesn't want to, us to do that. Jesus himself says in Matthew 26, those who take up the sword will die by the sword. This has always been the plan of God from the Old Testament, New Testament, and now. In the battles we face, his desire is for him to fight your battles. So this ambush, I don't think it was hornets, but the Ammonites and the Moabites, they firstly fought against the Mennonites, so against those that lived at Mount Seir. And 2 Kings 3.23 tells us of another miraculous battle when the tides were different. This was a battle when Moab was fighting against Israel, Judah, and Edom. And God filled a whole bunch of holes in the ground with water. And then the Moabites came over to attack and they saw the water and they thought it was blood and they, and they went down there. But that's a different story. But I guess, oh no, so, sorry, let me read this. The three armies, this is what they said when the Moabites came over and saw the water that they thought was blood. This is what they said. The three armies must have attacked and killed each other. Let's go, men, and collect the plunder. So back to our story today, how did God set this ambush? I think they saw an opportunity to defeat Jehoshaphat and to get all the spoil for themselves. And so everyone was primed with the Moabites, the Ammonites, and the Meonites, and others that were there as well. The soldiers were on the edge. They didn't trust anyone, not in the slightest. And they had been against each other in the past. 
So what was gonna change in the future? So I think God set up a situation which triggered their own desires and passions. So whatever the Ammonites and the Moabites saw, they determined that the guys from Mount Seir were up to no good. And so they aligned themselves to, rem- to wipe them out and then there would be more loot for us. And then after that happened and they defeated the Midianites, they just turned on each other. God doesn't force us in a situation, but because of free will, I believe he steps back and takes away his hand of protection. And then we destroy ourselves. This is the result of sin. I encourage you to read the conclusion yourself to this story. It's found in verses 24 to 30. But in summary, after the ambush, they came, Jehoshaphat and his people came over the wilderness, and behold, the horde of armies was dead. They took three days to collect all the loot, precious gems and things, clothes. And on the fourth day, they blessed the Lord in the valley of Baraka. And they sung and praised God all the way back to Jerusalem. What a victory. King Jehoshaphat could have responded to this challenge very differently. He could have gathered his army that he had. He had a big army. He could have done so without seeking God, without praising God, without obeying God's instructions. But the outcome, I think, would have been different. So let's not position ourselves before the challenges that lay before us, but position ourselves before God. No matter how big or small your trial is, position yourself before God and watch him fight for you. So just as in conclusion, I'd like to compare the Red Sea crossing to this story, as I think there's some interesting comparisons. So at the Red Sea, you may remember as the Israelites left Egypt, being chased by the Egyptians, the approaching, they were backed up against the Red Sea. The approaching army, they were scared. Okay, it's okay to be scared. These people were scared. Jehoshaphat, he had a big army. He had God's providence in the past, but he was terrified at what he saw in front of him. Jehoshaphat was scared. Both of these stories had dead bodies that were visible. Not a good thing. But that it was a sense of victory over the problem. There was both treasure in these stories. They had taken from the Egyptians um, prior to this, and Jehoshaphat, after the victory, had, had treasures. The Red Sea, the main difference here I want you to look at The Red Sea, these people of no to little faith, they praised God excitedly after the victory. After they'd seen a miracle, they said, yes, we praise you, God, we love you. Jehoshaphat, very different. Before the battle took place, he praised God. And after the victory as well, he praised God. So today, you and me, Our battles, your battles, they are scary, and it's okay to be scared. But there is evidence of victory, and we do have blessings and are blessed through victory. So what do you choose to praise after an answer to prayer or to praise God before the answer to prayer? The Israelites had little faith, even after seeing miracle after miracle in front of them. So it doesn't take faith to praise God, but we do need to pause to remember how God has has given us victories in the past. For the Judeans, however, it did take faith to praise God before any miracle had occurred. I believe God wants to bless us no matter if we have little or no faith or whether we have lots of faith. God wants to bless us. Ellen White, a founder of the Adventist church, gives a beautiful quote that talks about Jehoshaphat's people. And she's reflecting on when the people were praising God 
as they were marching into battle. And it says, they possessed the beauty of holiness. If more praising of God were engaged in the now, hope and courage and faith would steadily increase. And I believe that's true. Faith is not something that you can necessarily just grab a whole chunk of at once. It's something, little things one after the other. Put your trust in Jesus today. Praise his name. Before your next battle, stand firm before God and watch him fight for you, no matter what your trial is. Nothing is too big for God. Jesus says in Luke 18, 27, what is impossible for people is possible with God. Do you believe it? I sure do. Will you please stand as we pray? Just bow your heads with me. Dear Heavenly Father, here before you, Lord, we each have a battle before us. We don't know what to do, but Jesus, our eyes are on you. Nothing is impossible for you, God. You have told us. Please stay before us. We praise your name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I praise you for what you will do in my life, in our lives, this week, even today. I'm waiting to see your saving power as you promise. Your love endures forever. May your name be blessed in all this world as we seek your face. We need your help. I pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.